All right, it looks like we're just about ready for session four of the Game RT's March mini conference on TTRPGs and libraries. I'm Liz Brown. I'm the Game RT secretary, and I am also an outreach and instruction librarian at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. This session will run from now until three o'clock central time. It is being recorded and live streamed on Twitch. All recordings of the sessions will be available on our Twitch channel after the event. Copies of the slides for presentations are linked in the conference group resource doc, which will be linked in chat. For this session, we'll have two 30 minute presentations followed by a Q&A for both for all of the presenters. If you have questions for the presenters, please let us know who that question is directed towards and use the Zoom Q&A function. If you have never used Zoom Q&A before, please see the note about it that is going to be added into the chat. And if you are watching on Twitch, our tech team will snag your questions to add to the Zoom Q&A. That's everything I think I need to cover here. Uh, our first presenter I'm very pleased to introduce is Jonathan Gronley with Games as Transmedial and Interdisciplinary Community Building Tools in Academic Libraries. Jonathan, take it away. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, so let me just get my slides up. So at the moment, I am a library specialist in the NEIU Libraries Access Services Department. And a lot of what I end up doing is just working with the general public. So uh, training student workers, working reference, checking stuff in and out, helping out with grab and go, and occasionally helping out with programming due to the nature of my work. Uh, a little background on the school, the enrollment in, sorry, uh, seems to be acting up just a little, there we go. The enrollment of the school in fall 2022 was 5,700 5,756 students, 4,207 of those were undergraduates, the rest were graduates. Uh, one thing that was brought up in my abstract was times of uncertainty, and the next point actually covers it pretty well. Uh, we were actually hit hard in student recruitment and retention. Uh, by a 793-day state budget impasse. And right as we were recovering from that, COVID. So not a great mix. We are predominantly a commuter school, but we had opened up a dorm in 2016. We're starting to bounce back a little in enrollment, but in terms of retention, still work needs to be done. But the important thing is NEIU is not unique regarding retention and completion issues. <clears throat> uh, regarding retention and completion, in 2020, the National Bureau of Economic Research found that, yes, more people are applying for college than ever before, but graduation rates and retention rates really haven't kept pace with the enrollment. Some of the data was pulled from national, uh, the uh, various IPEDS reports that schools have to do for the National Center for Educational Statistics. Nationally, about one in five students leave higher education within their first year, and more continue on but never complete a degree. At the time of the report, fewer than 60% of first-time, full-time degree-seeking students don't graduate within six years. It, or, sorry, uh, fewer than 60% actually graduate within six years, but it has started to bounce back a bit, though. Uh, 
They found four major factors for attention issues, academic unpreparedness, tuition costs, institutional barriers like divestment from programs, closing classes, cutting off uh, different supports and uh, personal non-academic barriers. One of the big ones for personal non-academic was just a lack of sense of community. Because if you feel separated and estranged from your campus community, it just gets easier to, to disconnect and then eventually leave. Basic student information over uh, the fall 2021, over 19 million students nationally. 15.8 million of those were undergraduates and 10.7 of those were enrolled in four-year uh, four institutions. One of the studies looking into incorporating games into academic libraries looked at millennial students and digital natives and what their expe expectations are. And some of what they ended up privileging was interactivity, immediacy, group activity, a lot of Com, uh, a lot of quick and community-based interactions. Basic uh, gamer information in terms of play in general, it's universal. The Entertainment Software Association's report uh, for 2022 reported that about 66% 60, uh, of the United States plays specifically video games in a 21 uh 2021 infographic wizards of the coast cited 50 million players for dungeons and dragons worldwide with an estimated 13.7 million in the u.s alone and about 72 percent of uh that total amount is either gearing up to enter college or they already are or they already are working through grad school which actually says a lot and DD &D isn't the only system out there with a substantial base there's stuff like world of darkness with vampire the masquerade werewolf the apocalypse uh there's cyberpunk Pathfinder, Starfinder, plenty of other options. Uh, some overarching benefits to Dungeons and Dragons and similar, and similar games. I pulled this from Lucas Maxwell's presentation at LibLearnX on the social and mental health benefits. So some things that do, that would and do carry over into higher education, teamwork, turn taking, cooperation, moral and ethical examination, engagement with reading, but also depending on the system that you're in, also engagement with math. There's also created uh, creative writing and boosted confidence in decision-making and the ability to take on different projects. <clears throat> now, uh, in higher education, we also do end up with students who might be on the autistic spectrum or they might have other learning or developmental difficulties. So at least in terms of specific to ASD players and students, some benefits are controlled chaos so that they can learn to uh, parse out the important information that is necessary for the <clears throat> for advancement. There's time to practice on communication. There's making connections and building a community with others. And there's practicing empathy and understanding. So that way they can uh, communicate even more effectively. Additional benefits that weren't covered by Lucas Maxwell, game scenarios can actually be created in multiple different contexts, which allows for a lot more maneuverability in 
exploration of theories and concepts that are being studied across campuses. There can be a relatively low implement low costs of implementation if TTRPG programming is pursued. It just depends on the approach. For example, unless D&D Beyond took this away, if one of the library workers happens to have a subscription, they can actually share the books in their library with the players that they're working with. Uh, lots of room for interdepartmental cooperation and outreach, which can also lower the implementation cost. And then there's also the issue of scaffold, uh, scaffolded learning and instruction. Well-designed games and game experiences never intentionally drop more on the player than they can handle at any one time. Uh, you usually have some level of tutorial uh, before you actually move on. So you have a little bit of practice to test out different skills, different play styles. Now, what an academic library uh, a gaming collection and programming needs to do is supporting the curriculum of the institution, supporting the scholarly work of the, ins uh, the institution, so research projects from the students and the faculty. But the other thing is, since the libraries have started to become more of a social hub and a community building tool for universities, create a sense of belonging through interaction and just helping with build that sense and that uh, sense of community. Now there's obvious departments and people that would benefit from game programming. Computer science departments, whether they have game design classes or complete game design programs would be helpful because it encourages thinking about user experience focused design thought. Uh, English and media and media departments with creative uh, writing programs or programming creation would benefit. Psychology and social work departments, especially where things like play therapy is taught would benefit. Philosophy departments, ethics, philosophy of mind, religion, and spirituality, philosophy of law, medical ethics, plenty of other ideas that end up getting studied within a philosophy department can actually be covered with this. Then there are uh, any of the students, staff, or faculty that have popular culture or game related projects since a lot of games have drifted into different transmedial uh, implementations with, for example, uh, The Walking Dead has the show, the comics, the games, and is now becoming a tabletop role playing game just for one example. So there's plenty of room for that kind of stuff, but also there is the opportunity for if students and faculty working on major projects are looking to simulate what they're studying, it's a relatively low cost for trying to simulate it. And it's, it's a approachable means for getting buy-in. A short list of less obvious departments, business, finance, accounting, economics, creation and testing of economic models, art, creation of battle maps, props, tokens, minis, character portraits, just all uh, a whole bunch of other things that can actually tie in. Theater, character building and improv, music, you could get students or faculty within the music department to create pieces to kind of add atmosphere for play events and play sessions. 
And then in terms of media, there's the potential for creation or analysis of play programming as a term project, as a term project, honors thesis or master's thesis if your institution actually offers uh, master's or doctoral programs. <clears throat> now, one quick example from the games and gamification in academic libraries books uh, was, wait, what's that from that? Okay, uh, but one quick example of quick community building benefits comes from Mud Library in Lawrence University, which after their first gaming tournament in 2009 surveyed students and student workers. 50% of respondents met people who uh, met people with shared interests that they wouldn't have otherwise due to different program enrollment and you know larger campuses it might be harder to actually interact with people from different departments 76.5 of the respond 76.5 uh, percent uh, of the respondents said that the programming actually increased their sense of belonging within the university community so yeah uh part of what this is, is also kind of putting together my thoughts on what I can do to actually implement some game related programs, not only for the Northeastern libraries, uh, library system, but also Northeastern Illinois University itself. So starting goals would, we already have a small tabletop game collection, just not tabletop role playing game. So one of the things that I'm planning on doing is increasing the visibility of the existing game collection by building a live guide and trying to advertise it with at least the student newspaper and the uh, the campus radio station. Uh, survey the campus during library and university events geared towards relaxation around finals, since that's right around the corner. So that would gauge campus interest and would see what kind of games and experiences students, staff, and faculty would like. Finding partners within the school including student student activities, student counseling services, and different academic departments to gauge their interest in actually helping the uh, helping the library out with it. And then just to keep it simple, accessible, and affordable at the start, focus on one major tabletop role playing game like Dungeons and Dragons and then a couple of popular micro RPGs that could be free, for example, Honey Heist, which has a lot of uh, a lot of actual plays, including some directly from major outlets like Critical Role. So one of the things that I was thinking, run a soft launch event in October and then uh, have the library participate in International Games Month to try to gain more momentum. Then there is just growing the program, depending on the way that it's actually brought up, uh, continuing to build and strengthen the, rel the relationships within the schools, within the different departments that would actually benefit, and but also helping improve the university's outreach by identifying and reaching out to potential business partners like game stores, local game, uh, local game development companies. And that could be a means of justifying itself by opening up uh, potential internship opportunities for students but also 
for the sake of recruitment, opening up game events to the local area high schools eventually, probably within a year of this actually starting. Through the partnerships of with different departments, start building different themed game events using one of the games in the collection to highlight di uh, different research that's happening around campus. So for example, if someone in the health sciences department at Northeastern is doing a study on the pandemic, one of the games that we actually have in the library collection is actually pandemic. So we could run a playthrough and then offer a Q&A with that professor who is doing research about, uh, about that field. Further down the line, based on the needs and interests of the campus community, increase the game offerings start implementing game jams that students, staff, and faculty can participate in, building up their portfolios, resumes, and or CVs, help the participants get their creations up on itch.io, uh, help, uh, help put the links to their work in the institutional repository, and have a copy of the game jam creations put into the special library uh, the special collections in the library for preservation purposes we can also pull out those creations for potentially building uh, actual play shows using those creations to try to market not only what's coming out of the school but also market the school itself and then uh, also building up the idea of the themed scenarios based on research happening around the school as well. And actually, that is all of the information. So if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them at the Q&A portion. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I know uh, based on what I'm seeing in the chat, uh, what you're saying is and what you're experiencing is relating to a lot of the academic librarians in the audience, myself included. <laughs> and yes, just as a reminder, please do insert your chats into the Q&A function or into the chat so that we can answer them at the very end. Um, since we are running on time, I'll give just a few minutes, or, well, a few moments, not minutes, uh, for our next session presenters to get themselves loaded up. Our next presentation is Reference in Character, Designing a TTRPG for Reference Referral Training by Sarah Hartman Caverly, Alexandria Chisholm, and Brett Spencer. Let me know when you guys are ready and you guys can take it away. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to just assume we're ready. I saw Sarah and Brett in the room, um, but I'm going to get us started. Uh, so thank you to everybody for joining us for our presentation, Reference and Character, Designing a Tabletop Role-Playing Game for Reference Referral Training. To give you a little bit of a roadmap for day, today, we'll be introducing our reference and instruction team at Penn State Berks providing an overview of reference models and staffing considerations for libraries of all sorts, um, and reviewing elements uh, and considerations of reference referrals. And finally, we'll introduce our gamified reference referral training that we call Question Quest. So first, our team. Uh, to start, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alex Chisholm, and I am one of three liaison librarians at Penn State Berks. I will turn the mic over to let my colleagues introduce themselves. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Hartman Caverly. I'm a reference and instruction librarian at Penn State Berks with Alex as well. And I've been advising our campus tabletop gaming club. Hello, everyone. My name is Brett Spencer. I'm also a reference librarian. 
uh, lucky enough to work with Alex and Sarah at Penn State Berks and serve as the liaison to humanities and social sciences. Great, thank you, Sarah and Brett. Um, so you might have noticed the amazing D&D character artwork, uh, and there are corresponding research character sheets. If you'd like to check them out, they're linked on our, our slides here. Uh, but these were developed as a part of a, a larger week-long Stranger Things themed first year experience activity from a couple of years ago. And we'll give you further context for the gamified experience they were created for in just a few moments. So uh, I mentioned the D&D art uh, and profiles from the previous slide were part of a Dungeons and Dragons themed gamified learning experience. Um, we called that Deadline Demogorgon and if I can move my notes here, I'll be able to show that to you. So if you're interested, these are all linked on our slides. We just wanted to showcase a little bit of our gamification, um, but those profiles were really created to go with this activity here that we used with students to introduce them to a very unique set of collections we have in the library. Pardon me while I move my notes around here. Oh, geez. All right. Um, so if you're interested in the many uh, varied ways that we integrate active learning in the form of gamification, you can take a look at some of these examples from on this slide, which range from kinesthetic learning to tabletop games, like our argument architect that Brett um, designed with another Penn State librarian, and virtual escape rooms like Exfiltration, which Sarah um, developed for with our entrepreneurship like community partner. Um, these have been integrated into both general education and disciplinary courses to teach information literacy concepts, as well as utilized in outreach initiatives to promote library collections, uh, like our Discovery Lab Tinder, if you want to take a look. We love gamification uh, because it increases student engagement in the learning process, and also it sparks creativity to keep us engaged and excited about our work. Uh, all three of us are mid-career at this point, and uh, many of you probably have noticed if you've been in this career for a while, things can get repetitive, so gamification is awesome um, for that. Now we're going to discuss the various reference and staffing models that can impact reference training at your location. Uh, while we are academic librarians working at a small regional campus of an R1 institution, reference services in some form or another exist in all libraries. So the traditional library reference desk first became popular in the late 1870s. So it's been around a while. Uh, since then, it's remained a prominent fixture in libraries and a focal public service point for users. While still widely implemented, critiques began as early as the 1980s with calls to eliminate the desk as an inefficient method for delivering needed assistance in our increasingly complex information ecosystem, which if we're talking about the 80s, it's gotten even more complex, right? There are a number of different reference models that libraries of all kinds employ as alternatives to the traditional reference desk. Uh, so the first one I'll point out is the Brandeis model. Uh, this is a two-tiered system with trained staff and students who answer basic queries and directional questions, referring patrons to an on-call librarian when needed. The hybrid model includes reference of all formats, face-to-face -face consultations, virtual, telephone, and tech help from one single desk that is staffed by librarians and trained staff. The inclusive staffing model is tiered and it utilizes well-trained staff and students with shared elements of the Brandeis and hybrid models. This service model most closely aligns with how we handle reference at Penn State Berks specifically. And finally, peer-to-peer -peer reference, where highly trained student workers serve as frontline reference, is becoming increasingly popular, particularly in higher ed um, for any academic librarians in the audience, um, due to students being more likely to approach a peer than a library worker for assistance. Um, and if you're interested in any of those models, we do have links on our slides to all those resources. So no matter what reference model your library uses, tiered reference referrals from single service points present nuanced customer service considerations. Reliable and accurate reference referrals thus rely on effective training. 
Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Brett to talk about that training and the elements and considerations of reference referrals. Thanks, Alex. Yes, so training is the talisman or sword, so to speak, uh, of the game, of the reference referral game there. That's the key to, to winning it there. So let's talk for a minute about the elements and considerations of reference referral. Now, this is a neat way to categorize the reference questions that we get in our libraries. It's called the READ scale. It stands for Reference Effort Assessment Data Scale, uh, created by Dr. Bella uh, Carr Gerlich, who's currently at Texas Tech University. And this, it's a neat system. So I'll give you a flash review. So levels one and two are borderline directional questions. Those are the kind of reference questions where someone comes up maybe to a desk and says, where are the books on psychology? Now, level three is a liminal phase, a, a liminal level where you actually begin to enter the realm of reference services. That's when knowledge and skills come into play. And it often involves some point of need instruction and consultation of resources there. Then we go to levels four and five. That requires consultation of multiple resources, and there's often an authentic dialogue between the library worker and the user. And finally, the ultimate level, level six, that's where the most time and effort is required. Those are inquiries that can't be answered on the spot and often require a specialized uh, librarian of some sort to answer or multiple specialized librarians to, to answer there. So we'll keep that scale in the back of our mind as we proceed forward here. Uh, some other considerations when we're thinking about reference referral systems, we want to think about the reference model. Alex mentioned some of those ranging from traditional reference desk to tier to peer to peer models. Then we also want to think about our staffing. Maybe we have student workers, volunteers, library assistants, general reference librarians, specialist li reference librarians. And what, what levels in the read scale do we want each of those particular types of workers to help answer? We also wanna think about our service points. Uh, maybe we have a merged service point or maybe we're in libraries where we have a separate circulation and separate reference desk there. Uh, what kinds of questions on the read scale can be answered at the CERC desk versus having to be answered at the reference desk? And then we may have chat reference we, we take into account too in our reference referral models. Then we take, about, take into account the patron needs, the time of day there and the seasonal fluctuations that happen in the reference activities in our libraries and academic and high school libraries are often uh, seasonal reference questions are driven by the academic calendar. What, what papers are coming up due? And public libraries, maybe the summer reading program helps determine the flow of reference there. So now we can jump over and look at one of the first versions, version 1.0 of reference referral in our library. And that was a tip sheet. And you can see it has some menus a menu on the left there, and then some tips on the right. This uh, tip sheet was given to, was kept at our reference desk and given to student workers and our staff to give them some direction on what to do when someone asked a reference question and maybe a librarian wasn't available. You know, how do you refer that? What questions should they as students and staff answer versus what should they refer back to a reference library? So we, we, we had that sitting at the desk, but then we decided to level up. And you can guess probably how, we, how the leveling up took place, gamification there. Rather than just having a static tip sheet, we looked at ways to better meet our patrons' needs, uh, taking into account that our student library assistants often struggle with the expertise, patron expectations, navigating the 900 databases that we have at Penn State and the lack of practice there. 
what could be done to help them? Well, here's what can make it stick. Gamification there. And we've seen through the sessions today, gamification is fun. So it enhances motivation. And it also is a sim it also simulates reality there. So a student can be presented with a scenario that might happen at the reference desk. And then they have to decide what to do, which wasn't happening right with the with the static tip sheet there. Uh, gamification also has the potential to improve recall, retention, application, and affect real behavioral change there. So now everyone, we would like to introduce you to the heart of the presentation today. The game um, that is called Question Quest, and I'll tag Sarah now. Thanks so much, Brett, and thanks everyone for joining us again. So now we are going to dig deeper into the mechanics, theme, and components of Question Quest. So when you're thinking about game design, you can think about it in these three broad buckets of efforts that you should undertake if you want to create an original game. Again, these are theme, the aesthetics and storytelling of your game, the mechanics, the rules that players need to follow, as well as the rules that guide their interactions, and the components. What does the game look like? What does the game feel like? What does it require? So we're going to look at each of these buckets in some more detail. So the game theme is again conveyed through aesthetics and storytelling. Storytelling can be used to set the scene, to onboard your players, and to specify their objectives for quote, winning the game. For example, the onboarding script for Question Quest reads, visitors to Toon Library, that's our library, are full of surprises. You never know what they'll ask next. While staffing the library service desk, your quest is to refer patrons to the appropriate research help if you can't answer their question yourself, that is. In Question Quest, you will field a variety of patron inquiries and determine whether to answer the question directly, refer to a reference generalist or the Ask Desk or our Ask a Librarian chat, or refer to a liaison librarian for an in-depth research consult. Objective, to connect patrons with the information they need as quickly as possible, making the fewest referrals. The theme also includes player and non-player characters or NPCs. Our student library assistants are themselves the players and the player characters, so they are in character already, while the NPCs or non-player characters include the patrons and the professional staff that are introduced through scenarios throughout the gameplay. Inclusion was also a really important uh, and intentional consideration of the aesthetic design of Question Quest, so I want to give props to Alex whose interests include design thinking and design justice, and who performed the design work and selected a game motif that represents a diversity of student identities. Game mechanics then moving on from the theme are comprised of player interactions within the game and the rules that guide them. So we're going to examine each game element in more detail, but this outline gives you a really high level overview of game mechanics. Question Quest is a turn-based game with options for both cooperative and competitive gameplay. Some aspects of gameplay are left to chance, including the patron service scenario, the patron type, the question difficulty level, and the subject area. Based on these factors, players decide or the player's choice is whether to answer the patron's question or to make a reference referral. Game masters can then facilitate a debriefing discussion about the player's choice, and obviously myself, Alex, and Brett serve as the game masters to affirm the degree to which players have achieved the objective of connecting patrons with the information they need as quickly as possible, making the fewest referrals, and to provide additional guidance as needed. So again, Question Quest supports both cooperative and competitive gameplay. In cooperative gameplay, players can brainstorm responses together as a team and there's no scorekeeping. In competitive gameplay, competing players or teams can challenge a response and there is a point-based scoring system. And in case you were wondering, our student library assistants really prefer cooperative mode, but we thought we'd develop a competitive mode um, just in case there was ever a time where they were feeling a little feisty. All right, so now you're looking at the player's guides. This is one of the elements of the game that we'll talk a little bit about later. But these player's guides demonstrate the differences between cooperative gameplay, which you'll see on the left, and competitive gameplay, which you see on the right of your screen. 
In competitive gameplay, which is really based on the cooperative gameplay as a foundation, again, the competing players or teams can challenge an answer by proposing an alternate option. So if um, a student's feeling really confident and they say, all right, I've received this patron question, I'm going to answer it directly at the desk, the competing player or team might say, mm, that really seems like something you should refer, right? We're going to challenge your response. So the player whose turn it is in competitive gameplay can earn the point value of a D6 role for correctly answering the question type or correctly referring the question type. Um, and then the challenging player, if they challenge a response, can earn half the points for a correct challenge, but they risk losing the same number of points for an incorrect challenge. The purpose of this competitive approach is to incentivize thoughtful player choices rather than just incentivizing competing players taking a random chance on a challenge. And again, in case you were wondering, our student library assistants preferred cooperative mode. Some additional elements of chance in Question Quest include uh, the scenario cards, which we'll see in just a moment, which establish things like the day of the week, the time of day, and staffing levels in the library, which provide a lot of context to inform the players or the student library assistants' choices. Uh, a D4 role, which determines the patron type, such as student, faculty, or staff or community member. A D3 role, which determines the academic division of our college that the question subject comes from. So we're very conveniently divided between the humanities, arts, and social sciences supported by Brett, the science division supported by Alex, and engineering, business, and computing, which I support. And then a D6 role, which determines the question type. And this is really a challenge rating that's mapped to those six levels of the read scale for reference effort that Brett's already introduced you to. Here's a sample of our scenario cards. And again, these establish day, time, and staffing levels. And those staffing levels indicate the non-player characters or NPCs that are available to our players as resources in the game. So this enables our players to consider how busy the library service desk is at the time they're fielding the research question, as well as which library employees are available to assist with an answer or to receive a referral, which informs their choice to either answer or refer. Here's some additional elements of chance that are um, viewable in the Game Master's Guide. So at the top left of the Game Master's Guide, you can see the values assigned to all of the dice rolls. So the first thing would be the patron type. And again, this is a D4 or four-sided die dice roll, students, faculty, or staff or community members. Now, since most of our walk-in research questions come from students, the dice roll is weighted towards student patrons. So we have, I think values one and two um, would point to a student patron, value three would be faculty or four would be a staff or community member question. Then there's a D3 dice roll for the subject area, which again is mapped to these three academic divisions on our campus, humanities, arts and social sciences, science, and then engineering, business and computing. And in case you're not familiar and you're wondering what a three-sided die looks like, this is actually a D6 roll for which each of three options is assigned two possible values. Finally, there's that D6 dice roll for the question type, which determines the challenge rating of the reference question, again, mapped to that read scale. So you can see examples of the reference questions for each read scale level um, by academic division listed in the Game Master Guide. So again, if someone rolled uh, the D3 role was a five, that would be my division, right? Engineering, business, and computing. And then the question type D6 role was a level one, we'd be asking them, do library computers have SolidWorks installed, right? This is a CAD um, program. So that's kind of the type of directional question that Brett was explaining at the outset when we were talking about the read scale. If, however, they roll that um, D3 role of five, again, for engineering, business, and computing, but their question type role is a read scale six, now they're asking, I'm doing research to feasibility test a new product design for a business plan. That could go in a lot of different directions, right? We could be talking about market research. We could be talking about patent consultations. Um, we could be talking about, um, again, with uh, business planning, costing out materials and procurement. So that's a really in-depth consultation requiring a lot of subject matter familiarity, if not expertise. I caution against <laughs> considering myself an expert, but I have some familiarity, right? And as well as consulting a wide variety of really specialized resource, um, specialized research sources. So that would be something that we would like a student library assistant to refer to the liaison for uh, in-depth consultation. All right, so based on all of those elements of chance, the players then decide whether to answer a patron question or make a referral. Directly answering the question correctly is that target objective for read scale questions one to three, again, three being that kind of liminal zone that Brett talked about, 
while making an accurate referral is the target objective for read scale questions three through six, again, depending on the complexity of a read scale three question, or maybe the busyness of the service desk, right? Depending on the patron's need, this might include referring to a generalist or to chat reference for read scale questions three to four, but we generally encourage referrals to the campus subject liaison, either Brett, Alex, or myself for read scale questions three to six. These decisions are explained in the Game Master's debriefing discussion guide. Um, so we say Penn State University Libraries reference strategic action team proposes that anyone staffing a public service desk point be able to answer read scale one to three questions. At Toon Library, which is our home library, Read scale one to two questions can be answered at the service desk. Scale three to four questions can be referred to the ask desk when staffed, to a liaison librarian when available, or to our ask a librarian chat reference service. And those read scale five to six questions should always be referred to a liaison librarian for in-depth consultation. The guide directs game masters to discuss when it's helpful to provide a patron with the liaison librarian's contact info, even when referring them to an alternate service point, and to emphasize that the goal is to get the patron to the correct information with as few referrals as possible for optimal information service. So again, these game components is any technology needed to play the game and the kind of physical or phenomenological experience that they create. The question quest components that we've already kind of seen a lot throughout the presentation include those player and game master guides, the making referrals when a librarian is unavailable tip sheets, that version 1.0 of our training, scenario cards, and dice. So you need one uh, four-sided die and two six-sided die. Not pictured, but encouraged are snacks. <laughs> The last thing that we want to close out with is some practical tips and considerations for gamifying your own training in your own library. So while it's possible to design a successful professional development game informed by your own experience and intuition, there is also research and theory to help. According to Armstrong and Landers in their 2018 article, Gamification of Employee Training and Development, effective gamified training begins with a needs assessment to determine training goals and learning objectives. Once goals are identified, relevant theory and best practices from educational and organizational psychology and instructional design should be consulted to ensure that gamification techniques are the appropriate way to approach the training and to identify any applicable techniques to motivate and enhance learning. Theory should also guide design to accomplish your training goals. During gameplay implementation, the facilitator or game master should collect data or feedback to evaluate the effectiveness of the gamified training. Then you want to evaluate training effectiveness and iterate through these processes of needs assessment, theoretical framing, game design, implementation, and evaluation until your training achieves the desired goals. And again, while it's possible to kind of design a game based on your own intuition and prior experience, if you'd like to nerd out on a lot of game design theory, um, you can't do much better than the Board Game Design Lab's design theory guide, which is just this wealth of information about different considerations for designing your own gameplay. So with that, thanks so much for your attention and participation. We'll drop some additional contact info in the chat, as well as a link back to our materials, which we know are also in the conference folder. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much, you guys. That was a great presentation. And I know everyone was geeking out over how uh, all of your the resources that you've shared with us really looking forward to digging into those and, and using them in our practice. Um, I'm checking now to make sure we are covering all of the Q&A coming in. Please drop those in chat or in the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, while we're waiting for those to trickle in, I, I always have questions. So I'll, I'll get started with one of mine. Um, these projects that you're both of uh, all of you guys are describing are much larger than some of the iterative um, programming we've seen from the public librarians uh, who are previous presenters. How do you go about executing so, sort of these larger projects, you know, getting administrative buy-in, um, you know, getting faculty to, to play along with you and, and change, potentially change their syllabi um, to incorporate these like new gamification practices and um, try new things? How, like, do you have any successful tips for getting people to join your party? I'll, I'll let Sarah talk. I was just going to say probably exactly what she'll say. Um, we kind of don't ask permission. We just do it. 
we do the thing. So we're very passionate about this and typically just doing the thing. So let's say I, I also work with first year seminar beyond the science division. I just kind of started doing fun stuff. And the proof is in the pudding, as they say, like people are converted when they show up and they see how effective it is. Sometimes even we're very surprised by how well this goes. I know Deadline Demogorgon, which we showed you, we really weren't sure if that was going to translate well and work with students. And we piloted it with our international student orientation, which is a group that, you know, very easily that the theme could have gone over their heads. It went amazing. Uh, so I don't know. We just do the thing. I'll let Sarah talk now, but I'm sure she was going to say something very similar. I was gonna, you stole the words right out of my mouth. Again, as the chaotic, neutral, aligned game master of the three of us, we definitely, yeah, we definitely ask for forgiveness, not for permission. Another, um, I think, ingredient in our success has been that we haven't, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex and Brett, we generally haven't asked for a budget. We've been able to find really creative ways to do this for free or with existing resources or with, you know, bringing in dice from home, like that's not a big deal, right? Um, so if you can do it without a budget, generate a proof of concept. And then if you want to scale and ask for a budget or ask for a grant after that, that's a successful way to go about it. Um, and then the last advantage I'll acknowledge we have that may, maybe doesn't exist in the public and school libraries is we can leverage academic freedom. So in particular, when we are using gamification or game-based learning in our instruction, we can basically say, these are the learning goals and learning objectives I've set out for this session. They have been agreed upon with the disciplinary faculty member. These are the learning design considerations and accessibility and instructional design considerations I've incorporated in this game-based or gamified activity. And <laughs> like I have the academic freedom to do these things, right? Um, so again, that's something that may be unique to academic librarians, particularly with any kind of instructional or faculty status. Um, but it is something that it's always like in my, it's always my, the card up my sleeve, right? The ace up my sleeve to pull out if I really were to get a challenge. But as Alex mentioned, it hasn't been an issue because it's been, it's, you know, the proof is in the pudding. It's been proven so effective, so engaging. One other thing I'll mention, it's not quite as re relevant to Question Quest, but some of other gamified experiences um, based on student feedback, we have offered alternatives. So one of the last examples was a virtual escape room called Exfiltration. That's a competitive intelligence and intellectual property um, based research instruction module. Um, a lot of students loved it, but not all students. So I actually have a twin or like a parallel, more traditional research tutorial that students can work through that prefer to not be operating in gamified mode, right? Which is not everyone. Um, so offering kind of um, alternative learning experiences, if this is something that students need to complete coursework or to achieve some kind of learning. Yeah, exactly. Choose your own adventure. <laughs> achieve some kind of learning objectives, um, you know, is another way to go about kind of balancing gamification with folks' expectations for more traditional instruction. Thank you so much for that. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Jonathan? I mean, in my case, uh, as I brought up when I got into the, how do I know, how do I want to do this part? It's, this is more, uh, at the moment concept based, but in the case of other things that I've done, like start up a, a library run podcast about research coming out of the lib uh, coming out of the university, just trying to find ways to market the market the university, market the library, get more interaction from students, staff, faculty, and community members. Uh, a lot of it was just I had an idea, I happened to pitch it, and I happened to go, in the case of the podcast, we have the computers, we have the recording equipment, we have the recording software. We can actually do this essentially for free. Why not? Where's the harm? <laughs> That's definitely one of the strengths of TTRPGs that I'm seeing throughout all of these sessions is it it can be free. It can be totally free, depending on you know how you want to go about building the program. That's one of the great things. We did have a question come in. Uh, were you able to share your gamification training process with any other departments on campus? And what are their thoughts? Um, have they wanted you to partner with you uh, for to do more?
Alex, do you want to respond to that? I think you've had the most buy-in from elsewhere with some gamified stuff. I actually would disagree and say Brett has. Um, Brett, Brett works with um, the English 15, which is our rhetoric and composition gen ed um, program. And, and you, I want you to talk about argument architect. I feel like you've uh, had a lot of success with that. I have a little more control with first year seminar where students, faculty are opting to come in for programming, but I have full control over. Um, whereas Brett, I think has partnered in class options. So I'm gonna let him talk. Thanks, Alex. So yeah, uh, Argument Architect, it is a re rhetoric and research building board game. You can see a link to it up in, uh, thanks, there it is. Sarah put it in the chat there. And it basically uses the metaphor of constructing a building to construct, uh, to teach students how to construct an argument. And basically, Argument Architect works by taking uh, source tiles. They the, it comes with tiles that have little excerpts from sources put in them. And you can take those tiles and construct a building. And the reason I'm talking so slow, you may wonder, I'm bringing up a old slideshow of it to share on the screen here. So there, there it is. You take, students are presented with tiles right here. Uh, they're physical tiles. It can be done virtually too. And another librarian and I, uh, Elizabeth Nelson, partnered with the English composition faculty to do this game in some of their classes to teach source integration skills there. So we presented them with a set of sources. Each source tile was a level in the building and you had an MLA citation and then a quote from, the, from that source there. Then they had to use those tiles to construct a tower on a, based on a topic question. In this case, you might be surprised, we used the theme of video games. What are the themes of video? effects of video games, the students would choose three tiles from the pile here, and then they would write a thesis or claim statement in the top tile there after they constructed it. So they had to choose judiciously. They had to evaluate sources and decide what sources could adequately support a thesis uh, based on that theme. And our goal was to kind of teach students that you let your sources guide you to the thesis. You don't write a thesis before you look at your source tiles. You look at the source tiles first, then you write your thesis or claim after you've looked at those. So it was meant to teach several types, several learning outcomes, evaluating sources, how to create a thesis there. So it was meant to kind of blend librarianship with English composition rhetoric there and such. And um, yeah, so now um, I'll turn it over to John. I mean, did you have any Jonathan that you wanted to mention or? Uh, no, not to this question. <laughs> yeah, just to address the question directly, I don't think we've had any interest from any other departments or units about gamif gamification for like employee training, but we do obviously do a lot of it in the classroom. This actually, I have a follow up question for the gamification you guys have been doing. Um, when you are actually running these sessions, what does that look like uh, in terms of, uh, I'm thinking about how my student employees have like vastly different uh, schedules. So getting them all together to, to run something like Question Quest together, like how do you manage that? What does that look like? Full credit to our wonderful public services coordinator, Melissa Millar, um, who manages our student workers and a lot of the training that they undergo um, to work at Access Services. But she tends to, at great cost to her own schedule, find a common time each semester where students are able to meet, I believe it's monthly. Uh, so she generously shared 
one of those monthly times with us where we were able to, and, and to be fully, full disclosure, student schedules can be chaotic. They have a lot going on beyond classes. So I believe when we were running the game, someone showed up a little late, someone had to leave a little early. So we just kind of had to roll with, with that. But um, yes, our public services coordinator is really amazing at um, finding times to, to have that kind of training and social gathering. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, I have a question specifically for you. Have you found any faculty partners to discuss how their fields of study can lend texture to play? Um, you were sort of getting into the how many different um, connections we can build with TTRPGs and the different fields of study that there are. Actually, one of my, uh, so my master's in English I got from Northeastern, and one of the things that the, that my former graduate advisor is trying to do is also trying to get a interdisciplinary popular culture program started up. So I started, I'm starting to talk with him a little bit about that, especially since he has done game related uh, research and presentations in the past. So he is one of the people that I'm going to be uh, leaning on to try to get more support and more uh, buy-in from instructors and professors from across multiple disciplines. But in terms of the different tie-ins between the different departments, those are just things that I ended up noticing due to the fact that even if you look at like game design courses on LinkedIn Learning, they end up bring, bringing up a lot of different stuff themselves in terms of uh, history, narrative, art, music, economics within games and stuff like that. So uh, it's just more a mixture of personal knowledge and uh, uh, professional study. <laughs> That's definitely something that has sort of impetus uh, was an impetus for getting this entire event together is like the game roundtable collectively knows a lot of about the awesome games that are out there, but people kind of only know D and D and maybe Pathfinder. So we really wanted to sort of help share the knowledge of all the great resources that are out there. Um, I also I have another question coming in. Um, some uh, Carl wanted to know if any of the presenters work with graduate students specifically, and if so, does that change whether or not they incorporate gamification into their practices? So Penn State Berks is exclusively undergraduate students. I have worked previously with graduate level students. Um, I don't know, I've always joked, like even with undergrads, like they're not, I used to substitute teach uh, in K through 12 and they're not that much different than kindergartners in a lot of ways, like everybody. And I don't mean that like age-wise, I just mean all students, like you can kind of get away with a lot of goofy stuff if you, Brett in particular has a very charismatic personality. He can get away with anything in classes. He's very good at that. Um, but if you're, if you embrace the theme or the, the game, I think, and frame it well, it goes over. I, I can imagine it would go over good. It would go over well. I've done some goofy things with grad students in the past and eh, if it flops, we're all librarians. We have flops in classes, I'm sure. Yeah, Brett, the bar to the book stacks. He's got the charisma points if you look at our, our character sheets. <laughs> I mean, I do work with graduate students mostly because of my normal hours. I And Tuesday through Thursday, I'm in the 3.30 p.m. to close, uh, close shift. And from about 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. or 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., depending on the day, we have a graduate student working reference. So 
uh, me being the ranking person after about 6 p.m., I'm usually overseeing and supervising all of the library staff from the graduate reference worker to any of the student workers uh, under me in circulation. In terms of gamification, though, at the moment, North Northeastern doesn't really have much of a gamification tradition. That would be something that I'd be starting up if, if uh, my pitch is successful. I do want to throw in there um, something I neglected to mention, and that's just with gamification. We always, um, when we, whenever we write about this or present about this, we always talk about how important contextualizing the, the gamified experience is. So having debriefing discussions, and I think this would be important with graduate students too, but making sure that you're framing it and there's an actual meaningful learning experience there involved, they'll appreciate the gamification so the process was fun, but they're still gaining knowledge. Um, so that is something that we definitely always emphasize because this stuff can go you know, real goofy and off the walls, and then the point is missed, and we never want that to happen. So I wanted to throw that out there because we do typically highlight that a lot. We used to use uh, Jeopardy-style training at another institution I was at, University of Alabama, there um, to train library school graduate assistants there. And of course, with, there are lots of free Jeopardy templates already out on the web back in those days we didn't we didn't have those things there such i see a lot of agreement coming in with some of the statements you're making in the in the chat um yeah and i i would almost from personal experience i would say graduate students are almost more likely to get into the gamification because depending on what their study is like it's the only time they have to cut loose and to be a little goofy uh when you know if they're spending six hours in a lab or something like that <laughs> um i do have another question that's come in um where did it go ah here we go um this is for everyone what would your dream future project look like I'm assuming as it pertains to gaming. <laughs> I'll get started on that. Unless Alex, you want to jump in? Sorry. I think you're still muted, Sarah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I thought I was good. Um, so I don't know if this is what Alex was going to talk about, but with our other hat, we do is privacy literacy instruction. So I'm working on one uh, gamified learning experience, maybe she'll talk about the other one, that I'm calling an impossible to escape room, <laughs> which is um, surveillance themed. So the working title is You Can Run, and it's really, it would be a series of kind of choose your own adventure style scenarios where the player would, you know, choose their response to a given surveillance scenario and then learn about how that doesn't actually help them evade surveillance because of X technique that's also in use, right? Um, and then as Alex mentioned, there would be a textual debriefing at the end where they would learn more about the ubiquity of different surveillance technologies and how invasive they become. So that kind of yeah, choose your own adventure style, um, you know, impossible to escape room, um, working titled, you can run. I'm, you know, it's always on my back burner. It has been for years. So maybe, maybe sometime soon. Yeah, there's a couple of those privacy games that have been on our back burner for a while. The other one is, um, surveillance um, surveillance capitalism monopoly. Uh, so you would play monopoly while learning about the different data brokerages and, and just surveillance capitalism and generally um, through that gamified format. Uh, so that is, uh, <laughs> we keep saying we're working on this for years because it just keeps putting that on the back burner as Sarah mentioned, so. I think it would be great. My dream one day would be to have a an arcade of information literacy games out on the open web there that could be adapted, downloaded, and easily adapted to particular libraries. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, in my case, um, I actually kind of laid out what my 
eventual goal is like my three point area is borderline five year plan if this gets accepted. So, um, yeah, one of the big things that I would hope for is just building up a meaningful a, a meaningful game collection for the library that I work with, building up meaningful uh, programming around that, and then just finding ways to incorporate by designing context within those systems ways to kind of illustrate theories that are being tested out or examined by people within the school, whether it's students, staff, or faculty. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, one thing I hear throughout a lot of um, game and academic context is that need to draw connections between, you know, it's it's fun, absolutely. That's why everyone sort of joins in. But we also we always need to draw it back to learning outcomes, to you know, just to justify it to our stakeholders. Absolutely. So I have another question for everyone. Um, since a lot of us are talking about designing uh, games, and do you prefer to start from scratch, where you have complete control over the game you're designing, or like that your example of? Uh, surveillance monopoly um do you prefer to start with like a known entity um and then sort of build off of what people know that sort of relates also kind of relates to what you were mentioning in your presentation about scaffolding jonathan i think all options are on the table for me uh so i like to draw a lot of inspiration uh we had that discovery lab tinder as an example so that's not really a game uh, and it's also not something I've ever used. Like I may look my student's age, but I'm too old to have ever used a dating app. Um, but, or at least because I've been in a long-term monogamous relationship. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was an inspiration where it was something that was really popular with students. I knew it would resonate with them. And uh, it was fun to kind of research and figure out how to gamify exploration of this new area of our, our collections um, through that lens. Uh, so I think drawing inspiration from pop culture. So we did the Stranger Things um, theme for our one experience. And then Sarah, full disclosure, she's our game um, master. Like she's truly the dungeon master. She knows what she's talking about with D&D. Uh, so she really helped like drive that whole deadline Demogorgon example. Uh, but yeah, I think everything's on the table. I like starting fresh and I also like pulling inspiration from a lot of directions. That's just my personal preference. Mostly it's just like whatever is inspiring me in the moment and whatever needs I'm trying to answer. So. I think a big consideration for us when we're thinking about game design for learning or for training, we always rely on backward design techniques. So we're really guided by like, what is the end goal we need to achieve? What are the learning outcomes or the behavioral changes or, you know, what's the desired endpoint? And then what design or, or learning experience best serves that endpoint? Um, so I agree with Alex that we've done a lot to draw on existing metaphors or existing game formats and then kind of tweak them to our needs. Um, but really we're, we, the game is secondary to like, what do the learning outcomes need to be? And then what's the gameplay, be it cooperative, competitive, individual, asynchronous, right? That might best serve that need. And then what metaphors work, um, what game theme essentially works to reinforce those outcomes and then inform the discussion afterwards. To Sarah's point and uh, uh, mentioning something from that I mentioned a moment ago, an arcade of games, I think, I think we as librarians, if teams of us could build these kinds of things, um, you know, that would be great. And I put in the chat box an example of that and you may hear, hear it playing in the background there. Um, I'm old school. Atari 2600, and please, please tell me, are there other people who know what Atari 2600 are here? Am I the old? Okay, great. So I, I don't feel, I don't feel that old <laughs> there and such. 
but um, for example, I'll share my screen. So the link I put in the chat box, which is built by an educator in the UK, um, like here's old style Atari asteroids. But the point is to teach the library skill. And so you can see at the bottom here, the question is, what is a subject heading in a library database? It's a term used to organize articles by topic similar to a hashtag. Does it tell the author which one is it? Uh, uh, I'm going with number one here. Okay, cool. So there are these things out on the web where you can embed your own questions and different learning outcomes that you want to use there. I like that. So that's what I think we should we should build more of those and then we could all customize the games we find to our particular environments. There too. With always with the the idea of the learning outcome as the ultimate thing. I get carried away by the theme of the game sometimes. Sorry for the explosions in the background. I get carried away with the theme of the game and sometimes get off track with what the actual learning outcome is with students. But yeah, it's you know it's got to be edutainment. It's got to be educational entertainment there. Thanks. And Jonathan, just to maybe adapt this a little more to more specifically to what you were talking about, I think you talked about running game jams in the library. GameRT has some references, uh, has some resources that can help you with that. Um, and, that would be appreciated. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've uh, we had a couple past webinars about running game jams um, and building mystery hunts um, for you and for the audience. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have a, a sort of a approach towards, you know, building off what people already know versus trying to get them to start to create something completely new? I mean, in the case of in the case of games that I've actually run, I usually just built stories within within specific systems. For example, I've been working on a story for World of Darkness that actually kind of brings in all of the different rule sets within that world where yeah there is this one big threat but even all of these different factions vampires werewolves mummies that might be at war with each other need to make peace to actually uh overcome that one big threat uh and even in terms of like one of the things that I did when I was in my English master's was actually help one of the uh, one of the undergraduate students who was working on a game, uh, a uh, computer role playing game. I helped him actually finish it off, helped with fleshing out the story, and basically it was a RPG maker game and. Uh, the entire idea, uh, the entire idea of it was, even though it was in this uh, presentation that you would get from like early Final Fantasy and the Power Fantasy uh, storytelling, was what do you do when you can't save the world? So would you? be the one trying to offer comfort in the last years of the planet? Or would you be the one trying to offer stewardship to make whatever resources last, last longer? Or would you be the one to hoard everything and doom the world? So some of, some of it's just, I find ideas that I like from stories that I like and apply it to whatever rule system or whatever uh, whatever game development system I'm in the middle of using. Uh, with regards to game development, uh, Brett had a question for the audience about if anyone is using Google Apps as gaming platforms. Um, I know a I've heard a lot of librarians using Google Slides and the Google Suite to build like low tech 
escape rooms and things like that. So um, if anyone has, uh, well, if any other presenters have any questions, um, I'm doing one last sweep across our platforms to see if any other uh, questions have come in before we start um, our transition to the next uh, break. All right, Danielle is linking to some of those resources about using Google. Um, I will just take the minute to um, market some of the forthcoming programs that relate to some of what we've covered today. Um, GameRT is have holding, um, nope, that, not that one. Here we go. Um, uh, we have a co-sponsored webinar coming up with Exploding Kittens about creating engaging experiences through gameplay, which I believe is going to cover some game design to topics. That is going to be on April 3rd, uh, next Wednesday from 1 to 2 uh, Central Time. We also have a co-sponsored webinar with the Indiana State University uh, State Library about what research says. If you are interested in the topics that we were discussing in this past hour, uh, academic libraries and games, uh, that this will be another great one about building an academic video game collection on April 5th from 9 to 10. We also have, uh, for the public librarians who might still be around, Roll to Reflect, how youth can build social and emotional skills with tabletop role playing games. That's coming up April 21st from 1 to 2 o'clock. Um, I believe we will be uh, dropping links for those uh, events in the chat, and they are also in our reference documents for the event. Checking, here we go, yep. Things are rolling in. And I think we will try to squeeze in some of those past uh, webinars that we have offered, uh, building uh, escape virtual escape rooms and uh, running game jams. Those are two that GameRT has uh, offered in the past couple months. I don't know the exact dates, but the recordings um, should be available and uh, shortly. Oh man, our the gremlins in the chat are doing such a great job keeping up with all these links. <laughs> let me give them a few minutes, let me buy them a few minutes of time. Uh, I do want to thank all of our presenters today uh, for their great uh, presentations and resources and for answering all of my many questions. Um, if you are sticking around, we are getting ready to go into a 30 minute break. Let me pull up our schedule here. So many tabs. We'll be rejoining at four o'clock for the final block of this conference, uh, four o'clock central time. Uh, in the meantime, we're just gonna take a break. Uh, feel free to join us on Discord to keep the conversation